This is the last reading of, uh, this semester. Um, and so before I um, introduce our guest, I'd like to make sure that um, you turn off your cell phones or put them on silent so that we don't hear beeping in the middle of a great poem. Um, so tonight our guest is Kevin Young. Um, and he is widely re uh, regarded as one of the leading poets, poets of his generation, one who finds meaning and inspiration in African-American music, particularly the blues, and in the bittersweet history of black America. Um, his newest book is Dear Darkness, which actually I have, we have right here. Um, and for the Confederate Dead, which was his previous book and which we also have here, um, was published uh, in last year, in 2007. His earlier collection, Black Maria, poems produced and directed by Kevin Young, is a film noir in verse, a playful homage to the language and imagery of Hollywood detective film, films. Um, Kevin Young was a 1993 National Poetry Series winner for Most Way Home, a volume of meditations on racism, slavery, poverty, and the meaning of home in the collective memory of Amer African Americans. Most Way Home also received the John Zachary's first book award of Plowshares magazines. Other collections include To Repel Ghosts, Five Sides in B Minor, a poetic tribute to painter and graffiti artist Jean-Michel Basquiat, and a finalist for the James Lowlan Award of the Academy of American Poets. And Jelly Roll, a blues, um, a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Award. Um, Young's poetry and essays have also appeared in the New Yorker, New York Times Book Review, Paris Review, Kenyan Review, and Kalalu. His awards include a Stegner Fellowship in Poetry at Stanford University, a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, and a McDowell Colony Fellowship. He is currently a professor of poetry at Emory University right here in Atlanta. So um, why don't you join me to welcome Kevin Young. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having me and for coming out tonight. I um, thought I'd start with some poems from Dear Darkness, my latest book, and um, go from there. This poem uh, is called Sunday Drive. And um, in it I was thinking of taking a drive, but also um, I guess thinking of uh, belonging and place. Um, <coughs> so I'll just read it. It's called Sunday Drive. I've been called by God to testify against him. And the heart in its whole knocks trying to get out. Pretty cage. Sorrow, the plate scraped clean. It's neither the food eaten too fast to enjoy, nor the empty plate, but the scraping. What a song, all night long, the silence singing. The moles making their way beneath me while I sleep. And Houdini, who could escape anything. All he wanted was to find a way to speak with his dead mother, so spent most his life proving seances false. Now that's love. He died because he wasn't ready. Me, I'm second hand like sections in the bookstore I never noticed before. Mysteries or used philosophy. Downtown a hotel declares Welcome, Great West Casualty. Why not decide the road along the rise? 
past the drive-in showing nothing and the church sign on the fritz flashing like lightning. Oh, thank you. I've been writing a lot of blues poems. My third book was called Jelly Roll of Blues. And uh, in it, there were a lot of poems about sort of love and loss. Um, and the blues poems I've been writing lately that are in this book are more, um, I don't know, they're more musical in a different way. They're interested in telling a kind of story that only the blues can tell, a hard luck tale. Um, what Langston Hughes called laughing to keep from crying. Um, some of my favorite definitions of the blues are the blues ain't nothing but a good man feeling bad. Um, and then there's another definition someone reminded me of, which is the blues ain't nothing but a bad woman feeling good. So you have to kind of <laughs> keep both of those in your mind. So this <coughs> is called Black Cat Blues. Black Cat Blues. I showed up for jury duty. Turns out the one on trial was me. Paid me for my time and still I couldn't make bail. Judge that showed up was my ex-wife. <laughs> now that was some hard time. She sentenced me to remarry. I chose firing squad instead. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, plenty of volunteers to take the first shot, but no one wanted to spring for the bullets. Governor commuted my term to life in a cell more comfortable than this here skin I've been living in. Thanks. <clears throat> Slow drag blues. I don't believe in sex after marriage. <laughs> My wife does, just not with me. <laughs> I plead the fifth of whiskey. I am close to perfecting a theory of forgettability. Grief a dog that keeps dogging me. Good grief, I say. It's me he's teaching to beg. My next anniversary is newspaper. Yesterday's lying in my cage. Tomorrow the day I hope to learn to stay. This is uh, called Flash Flood Blues. I'm the African American sheep of the family. I got my master's degree in slavery. Immigrant to the American dream, a vacuee, I seen the water ladder its way above me, swam to the savings and loan. No one home. I've steered hardship so long, even my wages of sin been garnished. Wolf tickets half off, collect call and response. Whenever we pass on the street, death pretends not to know me, though the grapevines say, he's my daddy. Thank you. Uh, there's another series of poems about lots of different kinds of music. Um, this poem's called Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere. I have driven for miles with bottles left on my roof. For miles, folks pointing out warnings I thought welcomes. I have waved back. The sound of broken glass follows me around like a stray. Good boy stay and the whales washing themselves ashore nothing can save all day blankets wet their skin like we're taught to put fires out and the volunteers pushing them back out at high tide sleep well exhausted even proud before 40 more the same days later pilot themselves ashore again blow holes opening and closing like fists. And the sound and the fires out west started by someone lighting love letters she didn't want turns out to be a lie. Blue, blue windows behind the stars. 
And what if they had been people instead of whales, my mother wonders, would that many gather to save us? Just enough light to read. My previous book was called For the Confederate Dead. Um, and it, uh, I had to, told them, you need to put some black folks on the cover so people don't mistake it as a, um, I don't know, some Confederate tract or something. Because I was really interested in, uh, obviously, the idea of Southerness, but also an idea of uh, the original name of Confederate, which is to say an ally or a friend, the original meaning. And so there's a lot of allies in the book, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, Lorca appears. But um, I'll read a few poems from a series for a friend of mine named Philippe Wamba. He was a great writer and dancer um, and um, friend, and he uh, was killed in a car accident in Kenya. He was um, African and African American, which is to say his, uh, he was raised here and there. His father is African um, and a leader in the Congo, and his mother um, was born here in the States. So he was going back to work on his second book and uh, was killed. One of the strange things about his uh, death was that it was on the year anniversary of September 11th. So it was a day of you know, public mourning and people thinking about grief, uh, but in a public way. And just to have this private pain was strange. Um, so the poem, I guess, is about grief in a specific sense, but also in a larger sense. Uh, I'll read just a few poems from the sequence, which is called African Elegy. This poem's called Burial, No Woman, No Cry. A lot of the uh, poems have titles from Bob Marley songs. <clears throat> and so this is in Tanzania where he was buried. Burial, No Woman, No Cry. We circle the grave in dark coats like buzzards. The men me too, this morning had lifted you, steering your wooden ship through metal doors to the living room. I couldn't stand to see the screws still loose. A plank had felt we walked. They lifted the lid right there, and we filed past like ants, bearing twice our weight in sorrow. It wasn't true. That ain't you too gray and serious, right side of your face fallen, cotton filling your nose, at least the suit looked new. We held each other a long time after and could not speak like you. Get up, stand up, we'll sing later. The reggae you loved, your brother will strum, stumbling on a guitar, and for a moment you'll be there, here, where we'd been brought too late to visit like fools at the grave. We step past crumbling stones and dead flowers to stand on the red rise of dirt already dug for you. The sound of them letting you down, the sound of men scraping and scraping what I can't quite see, spreading the cool concrete over you by hand, and it takes long so long like death, like we once thought life. The choir lifts us up with their voices above the coconut trees. Habari Jamba, they sing, and the tune tells me, isn't that good news? Cell phones chiming their songs too. After, we place white flowers on your hardening tomb. Is it only the sun we shade our faces from our sweat, a thousand tears. Thanks. This is called Catch a Fire. And um, in this poem, um, much like I just flew back uh, from up north today, um, and uh, much like that, in this poem, I returned from uh, Tanzania in this case, and you know there had been a big storm that happened. Something had happened, uh, and so the poem's sort of about returning to loss as well as uh, meeting it somewhere. Catch a fire. 
I arrive home to cyclones, to trees broken like the heat hasn't yet. Autumn, nowhere in sight except a few leaves starting their fall fire. Driving without eyes for wreckage, I don't notice right away. Otis Redding sings, a change is gonna come, and I sob one last time, you're gone. High up, the billion sold, sign mangled, once golden arches turned almost an ampersand. A few miles along it dawns, what storms I've missed. Signs ripped down, roofs made only of tarp, pink tongues of insulation pulled from the mouths of houses, now silent. Looking for a sign from God, one billboard asks. This is it. What's left of the Hillview Motel no longer needs, say, a vacancy. Only the hill still hear the corn brown and shorn. In a few weeks, who can tell what's being built and what torn down? Flattened, the fields all look the same. For now, this charcoal smell fluttering past the hill. It's been too hard living, and I'm afraid to die. The thick smoke billowing from burning what's still green, but can't be saved. So I've been writing these odes um, to everyday things. And um, you know, I, when I was growing up, or after that, I guess, I learned that odes were you know, about nightingales and the west wind, Grecian urns. So I like to say these are my Grecian urns. Um, this poem's called Ode to Pork. <laughs> I wouldn't be here without you. Without you, I'd be umpteen pounds lighter and a lot less alive. You stuck round my ribs even when I treated you like a dog, dirty, I dare not eat. I know you're the blues because loving you may kill me. But still, you rock me down slow as ham hocks on the stove. Anyway, you come fried, cued, burnt to within one inch of your life. I love. Babe, I revere your every nickname. Bacon, chitlin, cracklin, sin. Some call you murder, shame's stepsister, then dress you up and declare you white and healthy, but you always come back sauced to me. Adam himself gave up a rib to see yours pile pink beside him. Your heaven is the only one worth wanting. You keep me all night cursing your four-letter name, the next begging for you again. Thanks. Does anyone here eat okra? Oh, good. Up north, that doesn't happen very often. People like the okra. Um, so it's nice to read these poems somewhere people get it. Um, the first part of the poem is spoken by a cousin of mine, and it's a true statement. Ode to Okra. I like okra because it slips, says my old cousin famously, and I agree. All the more filled with awe at all you can do. Wayward uncle, you grew up like a weed, yet were so much my age I called you brother. Like an eye or early autumn, you stay right around the edges and still green at the same time. Tender, yet prickly, you gave gifts whenever we needed them most. Visited each summer and lingered much too long, mooching your way through. Though some nights I hated you, to us and yourself you were true. Stayed stewed, never fried. The neighborhood drunk, turned belligerent, and too tough if ignored. Still, you weep when stirred, make a gumbo worth fasting for. Seventh son, pilgrim, you once were a slave, I heard, smuggled here in our hair to teach us home and what freedom wasn't. 
in dusk. I've seen my father cut you down, you who we prayed over each night, making sure small, steady star just for you we save plenty room. poem's called Ode to Hot Sauce. <laughs> Your leaving tastes of nothing, numb. I reach for you to cover my tongue like the burnt word of God. Surrender all to you, my fiery sacrifice. My father never admitted anything was too hot for him, even as the sweat drained down his forehead, found his worn collar and eyes. You make mine water, and even water won't quench you. Only bread bests you. Only the earth cools and quiets this leftover life, lights my open mouth. These days, I taste only its roof, my house on fire, all the doors locked, windows latched like my heart, my heart. Carve it out, and on the pyre, after the witch hunt and the devil's trial, after repentance and the bright blaze of belief, it will outlive even the final flame. This is why I take your sweet sting into my eyes and mouth like turpentine, rise and try to face the furnace of the day. This poem is a different kind of ode. It's called Ode to the Hotel Near the Children's Hospital. Praise the restless beds. Praise the beds that do not adjust, that won't lift the head to feed or lower for shots or blood or raise to watch the tinny TV. Praise the hotel TV that won't quit its murmur and holler. Praise visiting hours. Praise the room service that doesn't exist, just the slow delivery to the front desk of cooling pizzas and brown bags leaky, greasy, and clear. Praise the vending machines. Praise the change. Praise the hot water and the heat or the loud cool that helps the helpless sleep. Praise the front desk who knows to wake room 120 when the hospital rings. Praise the silent phone. Praise the dark drawn by thick daytime curtains after long nights of waiting awake. Praise the waiting and then praise the nothing that's better than bad news. Praise the wake-up call at 6 a.m. Praise the sleeping in. Praise the card hung on the door like a whisper, lips pressed silent. Praise the stranger's hands that change the sweat of sheets. Praise the checking out. Praise the going home to beds unmade for days. Beds that won't resurrect or rise, that lie there like a child should, sleeping tubeless. Praise this mess that can be left. Can't decide if I should stick with pork or not. <laughs> we, why not? Um, but uh, first off, I think I'll read um, another poem. Uh, this poem is called I Walk the Line. <clears throat> And it's uh, about Las Vegas, um, so there's not much to tell. I can only tell you the poem. I can't tell you what happened besides the poem. <clears throat> the other thing it's about is uh, Johnny Cash, um, the musician who died a few years ago. If you'll remember, Johnny Cash was sick for a long time, and his wife was supposed to die before him. Her name was June, but in fact, I'm sorry, he was supposed to die before his wife, but in fact she died before him. So the poem references that. I walk the line. The bags beneath my eyes are packed, 
but won't leave. Neither can I, my plane hit by lightning. So I check, check back into Vegas, feeling like late Elvis, not broke, but broken. Hard to know when you're sick of this place or just sick. There's always roulette. I only bet black. Soon my money gone like John A. Cash, who left us after a dozen almosts, spinning the rigged wheel like a tune. In May, June went, then July, August, and now Johnny, who we'll rename Autumn after. Sadder than a wedding dress in a thrift store. Salvation's an army, and son, the record I once found Cash's face on, warped but still good, for five bucks. Death does a brisk business, checking out. The next morning, I thought I saw God playing the cheap slots, praying he'll win before he loses. I give the wheel one last spin, playing the age I'll soon be, if I'm lucky. The age Jesus was when his daddy did him in and hit. Dealer stacks chips and asks, want to keep going? My plane waiting to fly me home again. I think hard a moment, tip big, cash out and split. I'll just read a few more. <clears throat> this poem um, is called On Being Blind. And it's about seeing a bluesman in, um, I think it was Indiana, play. And he was quite good. And this sort of happened. On Being Blind. Hard to compare pain. So when the short-sighted, pale girl lost her glasses, wheeling, whirling her hair and arms on the dance floor, we all quit dancing to look. From the stand, the blind blue singer stopped to announce, someone has lost their specs. But she shouted back, no eyes, I've lost my eyes. Beneath his shades, the black and bluesman just smiled and reached further into his monogrammed holster of harmonicas. Up South Blues. Afraid there'll be no cornbread in all the Midwest, my auntie arrives with a luggage heavy with bursting boxes of jiffy. My father's cousin keeps a potted cotton bloom in the corner of her brand new flowered living room to remember how far she's come. My auntie arrives in Kansas with her luggage stuffed with jiffy, just in case we don't have any. My daddy's philosophy always was, we shall overcome and fresh ammo for my gun. <laughs> I'll just read two more. That's all right. This uh, poem is called Aunties. I have quite a few of them, not just the one in that poem. So this poem is for them. And um, both my parents are from Louisiana, so um, that's sort of the background of this poem. And uh, m most of the other ones, too. Aunties. There's a way a woman will not relinquish her pocketbook, even pulled on stage or called up to the pulpit. There's a way only your auntie can make it taste right. Rice and gravy is a meal if my late great aunt Tuda makes it. Aunts cook like there's no tomorrow, and they're right. Too hot is how my aunt Tootie peppers everything, her name given by my father for seeing her smiling in her crib. There's a barrel full of rainwater beside the house that my infant father will fall into, trying to see himself the bottom. And there's his sister Margie yanking him out by his hair grown long as superstition. Never mind the fly swatter they chase you round the house and into the yard with. 
ready to whoop the daylights out of you, that's only a threat. Aunties will fix you potato salad and save you some. Godmothers, godsons, aunts smoke like it's going out of style, and it is. Make even gold teeth look right, shining, saying, I'll be John, with a sigh. Make way out of no way. Keep the key to the scale that weighed the cotton, the cane we raise more than our share of. If not them, then who will win heaven, holding tight to their pocketbooks at the pearly gates, just in case. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I hate when people do this, but maybe I'll read t these two quick poems. This one's, now I'll just read this one, which is Boudin. Does anyone know what Boudin is? It's, um, in Louisiana, it's sort of like um, a delicacy slash fast food, which is in every sort of corner store, um, roadside, uh, gas station has boudin for sale and boudin is basically uh, like sausage it's uh, sort of rice and meat spiced in a sort of like dirty rice in a sausage casing and people eat it day all day long I mean <laughs> breakfast midnight oh to boudin <clears throat> you are the chewing gum of God you are the reason I know that skin is only that, holds more than it meets. The heart of you is something I don't quite get, but don't want to. Even a fool like me can see your broken beauty, the way out in this world where most things disappear, driven into grounds. You are ground already, and like rice, you rise. Drunken deacon, sausages half-brother, Jambalaya's baby mama, you bring me back to the beginning, to where things live again. Homemade savior, you fed me the day my father sat under flowers, white as the gloves of pallbearers tossed on his beer. Soon, hands will lower him into ground richer than even you. For now, Root of all remembrance, your thick chain sets me spinning, thinking of how, like the small, perfect, possible, silent soul, you spill out like music, my daddy did, or grief, or both. Afterward, his sister is my aunt's dancing in the yard to a car radio tuned to Zydeco beneath the pecan trees. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I was told if you had questions. How did you know you wanted to be a poet? Uh, I didn't really know. Um, I think uh, it was just more of a habit than, a, than anything. But it's also kind of a calling. I mean, you, you get used to, you just, have a love of words, I think, in some way. And for me, I started, I always wrote little silly stories and things, and then I took a class um, when I was quite young, probably 13 or so. And um, that started me, and uh, he passed around your poem if it was okay. You know, he wouldn't put your name on it, and I think that was better that it didn't have your name on it, because I had a like secret thrill that, oh, my poem, you know, I never thought of a poem before. And so, um, that's how I started getting interested in writing, but I probably was about halfway through what became my first book before I felt comfortable with writing. You know, it just was something I had to do to get these stories down of my family in Louisiana, especially the way they lived, which probably until I went to college, I thought everybody's family ate, you know, okra for breakfast and, you know, had that kind of uh, childhood that my parents had, which is, you know, very much rural southern Louisiana, northern Louisiana. Um, and like my grandmother, and my grandparents, both of them spoke French. And, you know, so I thought, oh, that's just kind of normal. And then I suddenly realized that that was special and was something I had to write about. And I had sort of um, needed to write about my family, and, and that sort of uh, rooted me. 
Um, and then also, I think, just a love of language and the way they talked, but also the way people talk or crazy signs people make. And um, so that's what I think drew, drew me to poetry, but that's what kept me there. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I did because uh, one it was a personal reason, which is that my friend Philippe, who passed away, he um, loved Bob Marley and loved reggae, and we used to listen to it a lot. Um, and uh, after he died, it was sort of the only music I could listen to. Um, you know, there's something about uh, reggae in general, but Marley specifically, who's trying to tap into you know soul music in the sense that he's trying to capture uh, transcendence and you know one love and, and the notion of healing, I think. Um, also, quite specifically, when I, we were in uh, East Africa, after his funeral, we sort of stayed up all night, and you know, people, someone had a guitar, and we just started singing, and the song was, I mean, there are people from, you know, probably four or five continents, you know, Africa, Europe, the States, Latin America even, and people were, you know, singing Bob Marley songs. Everybody, it was a song everybody knew, and so in a way, um, it's a kind of a universal language, I felt like. Um, and to somehow capture this diaspora of feeling that we're all there together. It sort of united us. So it was a way of, of talking about that, I think. Don't be shy. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, well, the two blues poems that you wrote uh -huh. read about um, marriage, they're candidly, they're, they're candidly wicked. They're not autobiographical. I usually say that, okay. Um, but you have to be wicked in the blues. You can't be nice all the time. And um, you know, I think blues, uh, like I said, it's it's a bad woman feeling good sometimes, and and it's trying to walk this line between. Um, what, what Ralph Ellison calls fingering the jagged edge of existence, you know, really f sort of going against that, sorry, the jagged grain and feeling that kind of, um, I don't know, uh, place where tragedy and comedy meet. So, yeah, that poem was in a magazine and my wife was getting calls. <laughs> so, um, but it's not an autobiography. Yes? So a lot of your poems deal with the genre of blues and music. Have you ever thought of any other genres of music you might want to use? Well, like uh, I have that, uh, some reggae poems. And um, actually, that poem, I Walk the Line, in a way, is a country western poem. Um, and I found, you know, in my third book, Jelly Roll, which I didn't read from, uh, it takes the blues as a basis, but it goes into other kinds of music. And I think it's because the blues, you know, started all these other kinds of music, including country western. Um, you know, most all of the country western singers from Hank Williams on down learned through the blues and learned often from, you know, black singers, um, some of whom were quite unsung. And so, not to mention, you know, uh, rock and roll or hip hop. So really writing about the blues, you're writing about all music to me. Um, but uh, I actually literally have written about jazz and other figures like that, too. Yes? So who are some of your favorite musicians other than Bob Marley? Uh, I mean, I love Bob Marley, but I don't know if I would say he's my favorite. That's a good question. I really listen to all, you know, I have about 13,000 songs on my iPod, so I listen to like every different kind of music possible. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Santa Gold, this crazy singer lately. Um, and uh, so it's hard for me to nail, as soon as I say somebody, I feel like that's wrong. But you know, like everyone, I went through a Coltrane phase. I went through a, you know, this phase and that phase. Otis Redding, obviously, was in one of my uh, uh, poems. I guess, you know, soul music was the music I grew up with in the sense that that's the music my father used to play constantly. But he also played Willie Nelson, you know, I mean, he was like eclectic musically. And I always appreciated that, that he never sort of, you know, he, he hated a lot of things, but he didn't hate, uh, you know, something until he heard it, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah.
been the hardest thing um, to teach in poetry? Um, teach, you mean like writing poetry? That's a good question. What's the hardest thing in teaching uh, writing? I think that in a way it's uh, a kind of useful restlessness. You know, I think a lot of times people um, get in their comfort zones, especially as a young writer, you get in too early and um, you have to really shake things up. And if you don't, things will shake you up, you know, and so it's best to be prepared to write about a range of things. Um, for instance, I try to get my students to think about different kinds of form or sonnets or um, not in a strict way, but in a very loose way. And also say elegy because, you know, I've had cause to write a number of elegies um, in the past few years and you never know what's going to happen. And, um, you know, if I hadn't been able to write about it or write sideways about it, I'm not sure I w would, you know, have been able to move through it, you know which is to say you never move past it, but you kind of are in a different place, you know. And so I think that, um, you know, I, I've had students say, oh, uh, you know, a student of mine said, oh, I wrote a sonnet and I didn't want to write another one because it was good. And I was like, dang, you know, I mean, once you want to write 20, you know, it's like I made one free throw, I'm going to stop. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, the desire to keep going and tr try finding out. And then once you've done that, you know, change it completely. Uh, I try to, between books, change directions, and mostly it's habit now, but um, I find it can be a good exercise when you're starting out. Any other questions? Everyone. Yes. <laughs> um, you're influenced by music, but um, who who influenced you as a, as a writer, maybe, or, or what would be your influences, uh, po maybe poets that would have influenced you? Sure. Um, I, I think I'm as influenced by history as I am by, by music, uh, which is to say, I think that I really love the way that history happens in an everyday way, and that the way that everyday people move through history and time and, and make history. Um, part of it was that in my church growing up in, I grew up in Kansas, uh, in part, I moved around a lot, but lived in Kansas. Um, the pianist in my church was Linda Brown of Brown v. Board, the reason that schools got desegregated all across the country. And I think that being around someone who is part of history in this sort of symbolic way, but mainly I just loved, you know, she was a great singer and a wonderful pianist and really was a person. And so I loved this um, notion of her, uh, I don't want to say her private life, but her life that wasn't this public symbol, um, her life that was her daily life, I guess. Um, so I think that influenced me so much in thinking, and the poets I like, I think, write about daily life in some way. Um, Langston Hughes was not very important to me, going to Brooks. Um, but I try to be real omnivorous and voracious in what I read and not try to decide too early um, what I like or who I like. Um, a poet like John Berryman, uh, who is a strange, wonderful poet, I think was really useful for me at a certain point. And um, I guess really those, the poets who try to do something different, you know, and capture a moment, but also capture uh, a mood in a larger, maybe cultural uh, sense influenced me. Yes? Um, would you say your work embraces or endures your perception when you're writing or just your overall life? Hmm. Uh, how, how do you mean? I think, I think that's a good question, but <laughs> I, I don't want to mistake it. Mm. Some people write and they're struggling through it and so it's two different perceptions in a sense how it seems. Well, uh, the best way I could answer was is to tell an anecdote, which is that um, the, the ode poems, the poems to food, I uh, wrote after my father died. I couldn't write for a time and he died very suddenly and um, so I uh, couldn't write for what felt like forever and um, you know, I wrote things that were just 
getting it out, you know, expressing or something. Um, but those were the first poems I wrote, and they came in a huge bunch. I think what happened is I started writing about them. Uh, you know, I, I think I wrote the pork poem first, and that, it was sort of about pork, but really it was about yearning for something. And in a way, that was about him, I think. And then the poems, as, like I said, I was writing them in this burst, and by the sort of fifth sort of thing that came out that later became a poem, it started inching closer and closer to writing about him. So in a way, I feel like you have to go kind of sideways into some of these feelings, especially if they're overwhelming feelings. Uh, one of my friends and colleagues at Emory, um, Natasha Trethaway, I know was here recently, I guess last year, and um, you know, she has a book about her mother passing away that won the Pulitzer Prize, and in it she uses form, and I think in a way, uh, she uses like sonnets and different, you know, blues sonnets, different kinds of form, and I think worrying about like rhyme, say, is a way of getting at those emotions. You're distracting yourself, you know what I mean? And uh, for me, like those folk forms of cooking and the blues, that's a way of expressing a feeling, but not necessarily standing there naked, you know, just saying how you feel. You're also sort of trying to engage the form of it. So um, I think it's not. I, th I would almost say that usually those two tracks you're talking about, those are operating at the same time, I think, in the best poems, which is to say that they're layered. And I love poems that are layered, like Lucille Clifton's poems, which when you first read them, they seem maybe simple or maybe musical or maybe, oh, okay, I understand. But you look at it closer and closer, and it reveals more and more. And I th love art that does that, whether it's you know, a simple pop song that really is about a lot of other things. Uh, or, you know, jazz or, or what ha have you that unravels before your eyes in an interesting way. So I think poems are like that. You know, I think a lot of people feel poems, you know, aren't saying what they're trying to say, but I feel like they're trying to say it as best as possible, you know, and it just happens to be like music, which is to say it reveals more, the more you listen to it, the more you experience it. Um, so that's what I try to get out of a poem. Any last questions or is that it? No. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Sir.